Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Eric. That was yeah. really good. This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show today with legendary former drummer for Public Image Limited, Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, and Killing Joe, Martin Atkins. You're a producer, a writer, an engineer, a musician, a rock star. I don't know if I'm a rock star. How would you define the word rock star then if you don't think you're one? I came up through punk and what... Back in those days, the rock stars were the assholes on the pedestals who didn't talk to people, who didn't want to be bothered with uh, interacting with their fans. So um, uh, hopefully those of us that came up through punk are the antithesis of the traditional stereotype of a rock star. Like I was just in Toronto and I tweeted, who wants drums? And I played drums with these two guys um, uh, who were working on an EP? I just went over and played drums. I don't think a, I don't think a rock star would do that. A rock star would have their manager call, like, "Hey, Martin's interested in playing drums. Let me have my attorney send the paperwork over. There'd be some kind of negotiation and a fee and some bullshit." I, I just, I like doing stuff with people and meeting people. What was your family life like as a kid in Coventry, England? My dad was a, my dad used to play banjo and trombone, and at some point in his life made a decision between a big band, I think he was involved with a big band, um, and, and providing for his family. And he went to night school, worked his way up from the factory floor. So it's kind of a serious household, you know, uh, an old school household uh, um, after the war, you know. So my, my, my parents grew up during the war. So that stuff was still fresh over in England. And um, uh, I, I remember, although my dad bought me a drum kit and encouraged me, once things started to get really serious with the drums, um, it became a problem between me and him because he wanted me to enjoy the drums and then go and get a job, go to school, get a degree, you know, and, and go rise up that ladder that I don't know if that ladder exists really, you know. Um, so that, it, that became a problem. But it was a regular household. I have a sister, pretty normal, I think. What motivated you to pursue music as a vocation? I wanted to get better and be, play to more people. And of course, for any kid back then, I, w I would walk past the, the newsagent shop with all the music magazines and uh, imagine myself on the front cover of a music magazine or imagine myself performing on top of the Pops, which was our American bandstand, or, or Old Grey Whistle Test. Um, you know, I just wanted to get better and, and bigger and more successful. And um, I ended up playing eight shows a week when I was maybe 12 or 13 in the clubs in the north of England, backing strippers. Strippers were Sunday afternoons. So I was doing eight shows a week. I was talking to a couple of people last night about my right foot. I have a very fast right foot, my bass drum foot. And I think it's just because I was playing as a very young uh, kid, eight shows a week and, and it just my right foot moves quickly because of that. What kind of life lessons did you learn? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I remember uh, being sent up, the first stripper that we were working with. Uh, the guys in the band were much older than me. Um, and they sent me up to her dressing room to find out what kind of music uh, she wanted. And um, she answered the door naked. I was the first naked woman I'd seen. And I remember thinking, if my eyes... If I look at her chest, the guy behind her, who could be her husband, probably a manager, will probably punch me. Because I didn't know the etiquette of talking to strippers backstage. Mm -hmm. um, and she, I said, well, what kind of music would you like? And she said, well, anything that, that goes with leather gear and whips. Like, and I just said, yeah, great. Like, what did I know? I had no idea what went with... I didn't know what leather gear and whips was anyway at the age of 11. So I don't know if I, I got any life lessons from that other than retrospectively questioning my parents 
uh, supervision of me. You know, it seems it didn't seem strange at the time. It seems more strange now looking back than it did at the time. How did you discover punk, two-tone, and dub reggae music, and how invested in the local scene were you? So I was playing all the time. I practiced four or five hours a day. We were doing eight shows a week, and uh, technically proficient. And then here comes punk. Um, it was shocking to everybody. Um, it turned everything uh, upside down. There was no technical proficiency. Here's a chord, here's another, here's a third. Now start a band. And that was like, well, no, here's a chord, here's another, here's another, here's 20 more, go practice for two years and then maybe start a shitty band. So it would, felt threatening to me. And then some of my friends joined uh, punk bands. Um, a guy I knew uh, started playing drums for a band called Penetration, uh, who started to do quite well. Then I moved to London and things were just electric down there. Uh, with punk, and it just it just pulled you in. But also, the beginning of punk was quite broad. So, you know, of course you had Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious, but Elvis Costello was a punk. The Cars were a punk band. You know, uh, Blondie, who you look at Blondie now, it's a pop band. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the Bay City Rollers, really. But it was like, oh, it's punk. The Clash, you know, presented themselves, you know, combat rock. Wow, you know, um, this very broad array of music was 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 dubbed a, a, as punk. It's it's very narrow now, but back then it's quite broad. How did you come to join Public Image? My first trip to London, my dad had arranged for me to to get a ride with a moving company, go to London, do some auditions, get a ride back on the the Wednesday night or Thursday morning, and uh, I ran out of money. As I'm waiting. Uh, to leave London on the Wednesday, um, I pick up Melody Maker, which is the, the music magazine that everybody advertised in. I see this ad, uh, drummer required for band with a rather well-known singer. I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is John. This is the thing after the Sex Pistols. I called the number, it's like, hello, Virgin Records. I'm like, oh my God. This is this is John's new thing. They're like, well, uh, we can't really say, but yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm leaving tomorrow. When are the auditions? And they said, well, the auditions are Friday. I was leaving Thursday. I'm like, well, I'm out of money. I've got to go home. I don't have a ride. Can I have an audition tomorrow? And they're like, no, <laughs> the auditions are Friday. And, you know, I, I just didn't feel I could stay for one more day uh, and go to, to an audition. So I, I got my ride back um, to the north and um, every mile going home, I just thought, well, this is a terrible mistake. And uh, as soon as I got home, I told the guys I was in a band with, screw this, I'm moving to London. And they said, yeah, we'll move to London with you. We all moved to London and for the next 18 months, um, I would just, any time a drummer was fired from PIL or set on fire, which happened twice, um, I would call. Uh, I'd call Virgin Records. Uh, sometimes Jeanette Lee, who was the publicist and a member of the band, she'd be there. Um, she gave me a home number. Uh, one time she wasn't there, I ended up talking to her mum for an hour. So um, after maybe seven drummers in 18 months, um, I finally got my chance, which was ended up being to perform on the metal box, just one song on the metal box, just as they were finishing that up, which is pretty cool, really. How did your audition develop into you playing on Bad Baby for the metal box album? I walk into this room at the townhouse in London, and it's now I know it, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was the place that Phil Collins recorded in the air tonight. Do, 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 do you know? Um, crazy studio. Studio A was the size of a basketball court. So I thought I was going to a rehearsal room. Why would I think otherwise? I didn't, never met any of them. And I walk into this room and over in the distance there's a drum kit in the glass room. And uh, I go and sit behind the kit. Wobble picks up his bass. And in the, in the headphones I hear, rolling. I'm like, okay, do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, great. 
And that bad baby is my first four minutes and 40 seconds with the band. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, it was completely insane. And then I got back to my job. I was working for the government. Go back to my job for like a month before anything else happens. The next day, you know, I'm on the metal box. We, I'm on the front cover of Melody Maker. We did the John Peel show. Um, it's crazy. Highlights of the metal box slash second edition period for you. It's difficult to underestimate the power of that packaging. You know, it changed the way I viewed how what records could be. You know, and that the, the box, that canister with the PIL logo. Dennis Morris. Yeah, but also the artistic hustle, muscle, willpower to have Richard Branson do that. You know, it was the exertion of a lot of different forces. To, not many bands could have made that packaging happen. Um, so, so that. Um, but Old Grey Whistle Test, live television in the UK, the first uh, US tour in 1980, um, the Palladium in New York, New York Times Review, the Olympic Auditorium here in LA, American Bandstand, I mean, and then Wobble quit after that tour. So um, in a very brief period of time, oh, and in amongst there, there's the Paris show, which became mm -hmm. Paris Soprontoms. So within six months of me playing on Metal Box, I, you could say I'd done most of the things that I wanted to do with my life. Live album, live TV, American tour, great reviews in the New York Times and the LA Times. Being a part of American Bandstand. Well, this is one of the things I'm, I'm trying to get my head around. There are people who've described our performance on American Bandstand as questioning the structure of television, uh, you know, dismantling the framework of American society, all this, this uh, very highbrow strategic uh, thinking allocated to us. The reality was that the two songs we did, Pop Tones and Careering, were too long. So Warner Brothers had the songs cut down by a minute and a half each. And at every hotel we stayed at in the, the month before we did American Bandstand, there was a room with a boom box where we were supposed to sit and listen to the edits so that we could mime accurately. And you know, the beat remained the same, the songs weren't complicated. I think it was mainly for John. Um, but honestly, all we knew about that hotel room was that we could order room service in that room and somebody else will pay for it. What we we paid for it, but Warners would pay for it temporarily before billing it back to us. So when we when we jumped onto the set of American Bandstand, we didn't know the songs. We had no idea of the cultural significance of that show. And it just became a cat and mouse game of John running away from the cameras so they couldn't see he didn't know where the, where the words were anymore. We did a pretty good job of it. I mean, we obviously didn't care. I was looking at some photographs last week. At one point, I'm playing bass. You know, it's just like within PIL, there was this cocoon of we did not give a shit and we probably get away with it. So by the time we hit American Bandstand, there was an incident in New York City at the Palladium. We played for 30 minutes. John and Keith walked off stage and went back to the hotel. Now, any other band, if Justin Bieber did that, or Britney Spears, it would be in all the papers. Who does she think she is? There's no value. She has no work ethic. She shortchanged her audience. Bah, 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 bah. That's what you would expect. When it happened with Pill, at the Palladium in New York, the New York Times, and, and so John and Keith left me and Wobble on stage, and we, we played for another four or five minutes and left. Instead of saying, who do they think they are? These guys are assholes, they shortchange their audience, and you know, maybe a smart journalist would have said, thank goodness it ended only after 35 minutes because it was shit, you know, I don't know. But the New York Times said, oh my goodness, it began with the drums and bass and the foundation and it built up and just as it began it ended like and treated it as if once again we'd strategized this whole uh art statement 
Whereas in fact, John and Keith just went back to the hotel. So I think that by the time we got to California, we felt like we were cynical. Um, we were disillusioned. I think I was 20 years old. Why disillusioned? Why cynical? So we, we were talking about the, the work ethic of, of my family but earlier. And I think I definitely came from a background, and I still feel it, um, uh, where you do a good day's work for a good day's pay. Mm -hmm. You know, and half an hour on stage in New York was like shortchanging people. And the very least I expected was at least one journalist to call us out on it. And it felt like an emperor's new clothes type situation mm -hmm. that people were completely. Uh, deluded or, or just so in love with the idea of the Sex Pistols that they most people hadn't seen or, or the idea of John that anything John did oh he's uh, he's oh he spilt the he spilt the Pepsi what is he trying to say that like life is a stain mm -hmm. on the carpet of you no he fucking spilt the Pepsi actually mm -hmm. you know so and it was just like okay and so you add to that that we were the machinery that was dealing with us wasn't really hyper aware um, of, of the punk ideas mm -hmm. it was Warner Brothers machinery so we were you know um, the same people who were dealing with Van Halen on a day to day basis were dealing with us so it all just, it, nothing felt real. What was the mood in the studio during the Flowers of Romance recording sessions? It started off at the manor. It yeah. ended up not working out at the manor because John said there were ghosts and it just wasn't working out. And so they moved it back to town to townhouse yeah. studios. And that's kind of when you got more involved. Right. Apart from when I went in to do Bad Baby and everybody was there, uh, I don't think everybody was in the same room after that. I just saw Nick Launay last night who, who engineered, I would say he produced The Flowers of Romance actually. Um, but uh, he and I were in the studio alone and recorded under the house floor and closed walls, banging the door and something else, maybe two or three other things. So the mood when, when it was Nick and I was this hyper-focused lost in creativity. Um, I had a Mickey Mouse watch that I bought, uh, like a pocket watch that I bought at Disneyland the same week that we did Bandstand. And I would fall asleep at night in London with it under my pillow and I would hear all these rhythms inside the watch. And so um, when I brought that watch in uh, to show to Nick, um, I said, look, I, I'm hearing all these rhythms. I wanna play drums along to these rhythms in this watch. And instead of saying, you're an idiot, you know, well, I'll give you a metronome to play to, he put the, the watch on a floor tom-tom, so it resonated, and then he harmonized it, um, and it, so it was going left and right, left and right, and fueled my creativity, and the things that he was doing, you know, so, and I was fueling his creativity, and it was like this ping pong, crazy accelerated ping pong game of creativity that would lead to fully formed tracks. Um, I don't know if Keith was involved in Under the House or Foreign Close Walls. Maybe Banging the Door, he might have done a synth on. But uh, once we had a track, which was during the day, John might come in at four, five, six, or seven at night. And I remember thinking, you know, did we please him? Because you listen to Flowers of Romance now, and it's like, well, this is experimental as hell. Mm -hmm. In 1981, it was crazily experimental mm -hmm. and very different than the album before. And uh, I remember the, the genius of John. Um, he would be like, okay, drop me in. And he would just walk into the, the vocal booth and sing a fully formed vocal. Uh, just, it was pretty remarkable. Um, uh, Keith, at this point, was not well, and I think we all know what that means in terms of Keith. The heroin addiction problems. Yeah, and he would be the first to, to, mm -hmm. to admit to that. So Keith was absent, infatuated with Space Invaders, is my recollection, um, eating custard, which I think, I need to investigate that a little bit more, but I think that the kinds of food that you're interested in change with, with that addiction. So I just remember bowls of custard all, I didn't know what it meant, but I think I thought, 
Mm. And I wrote this, I have this one piece on the back of a brown paper bag. This is the end. And Keith is still lying on the floor. I mean, that, that's, that's what, what he did. So um, I also remember when I, the first uh, moment I walked into the studio I was anxious to hear what they'd done at the manor because you know understandably I'm thinking well is there room for me is there room for my drums what have they done mm -hmm. is anybody else playing drums on this and they played me Twist and Shout uh, the Beatles original recording with the vocals on one side the, the instrumental on the other they muted the vocals and John sang over the top I've never heard anything so punk in my life um, but clearly that wasn't going to be a new pill track and clearly a week had been spent at the manor and nothing had happened. So I guess I was lucky, you know, I was fired after that first American tour because um, I, I mouthed off. I mean, everything, the entire life cycle of a band happened in six months. Mm -hmm. I mouthed off on a radio interview, said everything was unprofessional, we needed a manager, it was a joke and I think I still think that was true then um, but uh, I understand that I was fired for saying that stuff ultimately so it was, it was interesting that they asked me back to to lay down some tracks and and it was a fantastic uh, few days what did you learn from uh, producer Nick Lunay I think he was also 10 weeks into his career he was an engineer at the time but as I said I would, the input I would say that was production the care he showed nurturing what were obviously pretty crazy ideas um, really uh, led to my ability to express myself and not be afraid of that. Um, and, and I think hopefully when I produce in the studio, I'm encouraging of, of anyone with what seems like a crazy idea. You know, I'll help somebody uh, visualize that idea, bring it to fruition. I might sit back and then go, well, we did it. We spent two days doing the, everything you wanted and it's absolutely crap. But along the way, I'll be encouraging and see where it's going. So how would you characterize your relationship with John Lydon during the 83, 84 recording sessions and tour for the PIL album, This Is What You Want, This Is What You Get? I would describe that relationship as okay um, I think that you know there was a time there PIL was just me and John for probably 18 months two years and um, uh, very similar tastes uh, sense of humor um, intolerance for bullshit um, and that can go either way you know that can be like great everybody's on the same page let's have another beer or just like brothers you know you can butt heads and it can get pretty serious and um, I think that with uh, the longer that went on, the more we butted heads, the harder our relationship became, for sure. Walk us through the commercial zone. This is not a love song single remix debacle in the studio between Keith Levine, you, John Lydon, on the phone from L.A. I describe this period... Keith is still in the band. Um, we're in New York as the biggest headphone cord entanglement of the whole history of Pill. There was, um, there's myself, there's Keith with the problems that Keith had. There's John, Nora is there. Um, John is involved with the cop killer movie with Harvey Keitel in Italy. Jeanette is still around. We have a relationship with a recording studio. We're maybe a year into this relationship. We owe them a lot of money. We're, it's a spec deal. So the studio doesn't ultimately know if they're going to get paid, but they do. And I'm, I'm trying to be a little analytical when, when I go through this stuff. I have cassette copies of all of the two inch tapes that were that we recorded and I went through them there's 15 rolls of two inch tape and I think you could put 17 to 20 minutes of music on a roll of two inch tape so there's over 300 minutes of recorded material in a studio in Times Square New York 
There's also one of our managers, Bob Tulipan, who was an immigration attorney, brought the Russian ballet over to New York. He's involved. Maureen Baker was involved as a photographer. Uh, strange, interesting group of people, New York at that time. And so uh, it was a mess. It was a mess. Um, f from what I understand now, we were heavily in debt with Virgin Records. And we hadn't delivered any music since The Flowers of Romance. So Virgin are like, okay, you've had all this money. Where's the album? Where's the album? We're in the studio, and I look at the track listing. There's five, six, seven versions of some songs. There's ten song titles. I have no idea. The Wild Geese. I'm like, what the hell is that? Now, it might turn out that it's Bad Life or something, but, but there's too many different song titles in addition to ones I recognize. I mean, uh, looking back, 2020 hindsight, as a manager now, I would say, guys, finish your fucking song. F you know, let's finish an EP before we unwrap another roll of two inch tape, or go on to roll 16. What do we have in the, pre you know, um, uh, as, a, as a producer, Come on, guys! Look what mm. what, do, what what works, what doesn't. What songs have got vocals? Could we put out an EP? Where, where are we? So this is where it gets really complicated. I, and I spent three hours skyping with Keith Levine. The best conversation we've ever had three months ago. Weirdly. Um, so Keith is in the studio. I'm in the studio. Bob Tulipan is around. Uh, um, Richard Branson came out, which I don't remember. John is in LA. Keith is remixing This Is Not A Love Song to hand over right then and there to Richard Branson. It's like, here's the hit, shut up. Um, and somehow I'm in the middle of all of that. Um, Keith describes it as me shopping him to John, Keith's in the studio mixing. And John, and John said, hand Keith the phone. I gave Keith the phone, and I think John said, get out of the studio. Um, but so that sounds like mayhem. Mm -hmm. The reason John was in LA was to meet with the person who became our next manager, Larry White, which I don't remember that either. And in fact, what happened shortly after that, some people have suggested that at this point, I make my move to take over the band. I'm like, okay, first off, I'm 21. Mm. I might have been 22. And what do I get? Right, Keith is one of my, one of my three favorite guitarists. Uh, Geordie from Killing Joke is, is, is one also. What, what did I win? If, if I was manipulating everything, what did I win? I won going to Japan with what, what I dubbed the Holiday Inn version of the band, a bunch of hired musicians in tuxedos. That was my prize, you know. Um, and I think uh, Pete Jones, who, who said that, has since taken it back like, oh, God, you know, so it was a mess, sorry. But um, we had a meeting um, because the Japanese dates were looming. We had 10 shows in Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, Osaka, somewhere else. Um, and we were going to have a meeting to clear the air and then Paul McCartney was arrested with eight ounces of weed. Um, he was in jail for 11 days, fined a million uh, pounds, I think. And that precipitated something called the Paul McCartney Clause in every Japanese performance agreement, uh, which was, if anybody's caught with weed, the tour's off, you're liable for all the damages, the profits the promoter thought they might make. I mean, it was a nightmare. Mm. So never mind weed, we had heroin involved mm. in our situation. And so we're, we called a meeting. Uh, and that meeting could have gone in any one of, it could have ended up with Keith getting help. Maybe we could have postponed Japan. We'd already spent a bunch of the money, but we could have explained it, well, I don't know. But. Uh, Keith showed up at that meeting with his attorney and that just changed the whole, instead of being an intimate cards on the table, what the hell are we going to do meeting, it was a ultimatum ridden uh, uh, 
mess that still feels raw to this day. But you guys go ahead and do the tour. We had like a month to hire and rehearse a, a, a new band. Mm -hmm. At this point, Pete Jones, the bass player who I've been friends with a long time, I'm friends with him again now. He just, he called one day. He's like, yeah, I'm at the airport. Screw this. He left with $12 in his pocket. Um, yeah. So we had to put a band together and go and do these dates. What are your thoughts on Kurt Cobain citing public images, the Flowers of Romance album as one of his favorites? It's strange that you mentioned that. God, that makes me want to cry. I'm doing my presentation tomorrow night, and that's one of my slides, is his handwritten list of the albums that he liked. To think that that music that we made, uh, that's part of my DNA, uh, as well as everybody else's, had such an effect. Um, man, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. What was your relationships like with guitarist Keith Levine and bassist Jaw Wobble during your time with PIL? Drummers and bass players, that's a different thing. You can't talk like intellectually about that. Like, well, we both had the same interests. I was playing drums, he was playing bass. So you're by nature connected at the hip or you're not, mm -hmm. you know? So there has to be a spiritual connection, I think, between a good drummer and bass player. So we were connected and we hung out a lot. I played on his solo album, unbeknownst to me, I thought we were doing PIL demos, his Betrayal album. So we were connected. I didn't know that he was just a few weeks from, from leaving for good when we toured America. My relationship with Keith was much more difficult. Um, uh, going back to my working class work ethic, I felt Keith was responsible for not being able to deliver um, live because of his problems. Uh, he became very ill at certain times, which jeopardized everything and freaked everybody out. This starts to be this dynamic where my lack of respect for Keith um, starts to fuel this thing where, of course, he felt that from me. Um, maybe he felt like he was a senior member of the band because he, he was, plus he'd been in The Clash. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't need to be getting shit from some drummer who's been in the band for eight months or a year or however long. So it's just a strange dynamic where I felt like his other problems were really starting to F things up. And I don't know that much about these things, but I would say that um, his addictions materialized in the form of six different versions of a song a lack of focus and a, a time wastingness and uh, all of that stuff. Tell me about the dare from bassist Pete Jones that turned into a fight with Gigi Allen while on tour with Brian Brain in 1981 in Boston. I was in and out of pill. and I got really busy after the first tour. I came back within a couple of months with my three-piece punk outfit. I sang, my drums were on reel-to-reel -reel tape. And so at the end of a 23 day tour um, in which I was bottled in Washington DC with a full bottle of Heineken, 16 stitches, eight subcutaneous stitches, really deep, it was a mess. Uh, I was in hospital in New Orleans with a problem, my, my stitches were infected. I had alcohol poisoning in San Francisco. We played them at Buhay Gardens. We were supposed to do two shows, we only made it through one. I was carried out on a stretcher, taken to hospital. So we get to the end of this crazy tour. We're in a club in Boston called the Rat Skella, legendary venue. And there's a guy on stage. Um, we, ju we just want to drink with these girls that we met and um, get a plane home the next day. And, and this guy's on stage, fuck you, oh, I wanna fuck your sister, fuck, 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 fuck you, fuck your mother, and we're just like, oh, come on, look. And Pete Jones said to me, uh, I'll buy you a white Russian if you'll go and sort this guy out. And I, I said, uh, make it two, Pete. And so then he bought me two white Russians, and this guy's still going on, fuck, you know. And I, I got up, I unplugged his mic, threw his mic there, pushed him on the floor, picked up a monitor, threw a monitor onto him, kicked over all the mics on stage, unplugged the bass, I mean, we were out of control. And, um, and then I think I realized I'd really done it. Yeah, I'd gone too far. And I stood on stage expecting the band and all their fans to jump on me, deservedly so. Uh, nothing happened. Three hours later, 
I was peeing uh, in the bathroom and uh, my head gets smashed from behind. I break my nose as I go into the wall and as I fall to the ground unconscious, I get kicked in the face and my jaw gets broken. And that was G.G. Allen. Highlights of your time in ministry from 1989 to 1990 and what is Al Jorgensen's personality like? As charismatic and as funny as John, very quick-witted, different thinker. And, you know, I think Pill and Killing Joke and G.G. Allen prepared me for ministry. There's a path from punk to post-punk. You know, me playing drums to a Mickey Mouse watch, you could say that's quite an industrial thing to do, you know, playing to a loop. I thought I was prepared uh, to be involved with ministry, but when Al invited me to the studio in Chicago, we were on tour with Killing Joke, when he invited me to the studio, the first ministry song I really heard, I, I looked over to the tape machine because I was waiting for the tape operator to put the song on at the right speed. Because it was just, it, I'm like, oh, this is insane. I would never do this. And um, it was crazy. And ministry at that time was just, and industrial music was just, just starting to become something. Nine Inch Nails weren't around. Well, Trent was in a basement doing demos, but um, uh, I remember we played Denver. One show, two days off. And it was chaos. Um, and as we come off stage before going back on for the encore, the promoter comes in and said, I'll give you $10,000 if you'll play tomorrow and announce it now. We're like, Okay, so we walk on stage, we're playing tomorrow, get your tickets, uh, uh, and the same thing happened the next night. Uh, so we went from one show with two days off to three sold out shows. And I remember knocking on Al's door, and I said, listen, I've seen this. When you're hot, you're hot, when you're not, you're not. I've seen the ascension of punk uh, in London, and something's going on here. You want me to quit killing joke now? and just let's stay on the road for another six months and get this to a point where it's undeniable, I'll do it. Um, but then the mayhem of that tour really started to take its toll on everybody. Uh, so that by the, the last three days, um, some people were on a bus, some people were like traveling by themselves on trains, Ann Arbor to Chicago. People were just like, I've got to get away from this insanity. I'm sure Al has calmed down in the last 20 years, otherwise he still wouldn't be around. But I don't think he's calmed down that much. But what a wild, what a wild time to be in that band. And in fact, the last two days of that tour, the, the Cage tour, is when I asked pretty much everybody on the road with us to jump in the studio with Steve Albini and form my band Pigface. Highlights of your time in Killing Joke, and you pretty much wore all the hats in the band at some point. Yeah, well, that was me. As, as much as I'd criticized Pill for the Olympic Auditorium show, for instance, we didn't have T-shirts. So to hear Keith on the radio going, yeah, we don't have management, I'm like, look, whatever we paid a manager to say, hey, you should have shirts, we would have been able to pay the manager and have profit and I've sold t-shirts, branding. Um, so rather than just talk about the problems of a lack of management, by the time I get into Killing Joke, it's obvious that they, they need a manager. And I just started to do it because if I hadn't, the band wouldn't have existed for me to be in. So um, we started to just take care of some stuff, brought them over to the States, because I knew people like Matt Pinfield were playing Killing Joke. Um, but it hadn't crystallized into anything. The band hadn't toured. So um, we really started to, uh, with Jerry Gerard's help, who's here in L.A. now, um, book some tours and really really start to make that happen. A highlight. Paul Raven, the bass player, who was sadly no longer with us. My drums were louder when we played together. Um, opening for the Pixies across Europe, 10,000-seat stadiums, open-air stadiums, and... Um, I mean, this was like a highlight and a low light. Um, so the band felt that we shouldn't be opening for the Pixies, that um, Killer Joke was huge and who the hell were they? And, and so there was this conversation in the dressing room, how could we like sabotage the Pixies? And it was 
but went pretty deep, quite alarming. You know, Paul Raven said, I, I can do this thing with a paper clip where I just do it right with the input and I can blow up the bass amp. Like, okay. I mean, it was like, oh, you know, uh, we could give them like food poisoning. You know, I mean, it's just like, uh, and at some point I said, or we could strategize the best killing joke 40 minutes set ever. Mm. You know, Kings and Queens, 80s, Love Like Blood, War Dance, uh, Nighttime, you know, hit after, Requiem, hit after hit after hit. And they're like, oh, oh okay. So um, that's what we did. And we got to, first off, we got to play this fantastic Killing Joke set, which was glorious. And I loved playing Paul Ferguson's drum beats from the early material. You got to see 10,000 people going crazy. But the icing on that cake was you'd look over and see uh, Black Francis Charles from the pick season uh, and the, 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 the Deal twins shitting their pants, mm -hmm. you know, because we were killing it and they had to, it's like, okay, follow that. <laughs> and it was so sweet, but it was also, it was bittersweet because that was th the last six months I had with the band. They started to get it, but there's so many other things going on. I just saw them. Um, uh, a month ago mm. in New York, maybe just three weeks ago. And uh, we're all friends now. I was best man at Geordie's wedding. And we're all friends, and I love that. Um, and they're all just the same. They're all the same. And it's just remarkably great music and a great attitude. How did Trent Reznor come to sing and write songs on the first Pig Face album? That's a good question. So with my band Brian Brain, um, we had a song called Funky Zoo. Don't Google it. Um, <laughs> but, but at that time, just like with This Is Not A Love Song, the trend then, and at Ministry had a track called Cold Life. You put horns on stuff. That's what we did. That's what everybody did. Ba -dip -dip, the big horn section. And uh, so um, that's what we did with the, this Brian Brain song. Let's go. Bow. Ba -da -da -ba. This big horn section. So we come to tour the States. It's like, well, what are we going to do? And so I made a cassette tape and I sent it out to a bunch of people. Sent it to my friend Tom in Cleveland. Please put a horn section together. And Trent played sax. Tom played trumpet. And that's when I met Trent. I want to say 80. 485 wow. and uh, we stayed in touch and at some point we were at a barbecue in Cleveland and he handed me a cassette of when working on some songs in the basement so we stayed friends um, I think he stayed on my floor in New Jersey when I had a loft there and um, so when when I was putting pig face together I'm like hey well that kid in Cleveland like Trent come and sing on a song and Nine Inch Nails were nothing then. I don't. They hadn't. They didn't have the TVT deal. They'd done a few shows. And actually, Steve Albini said to me one day, "Listen, Martin, wh why are we flying this kid from Cleveland? Let's save the hundred and fifty dollars airline ticket and have somebody else do it." I'm like, "No, he's my friend. I want him to come out and do this. You know, and it's kind of a cool thing that that." that He's on there. So we wrote Suck together, and when Nine Inch Nails were, I mean, they had like a whole video. That's me and Chris Vrenner. Mm -hmm. They recorded that at the Exit Club in Chicago. And then I went up to the Lake Geneva studio. Flood was producing that album, and I did a bunch of different drums, and, and the beat for Wish was one of them. And you have a Grammy because of that. Yeah, that worked out okay. Well, tell me about Flood. The story I like to tell about Flood is, you know, I asked students, engineering students, where does his name come from? And they're like, oh, it has to do with low-end frequencies flooding your senses. I'm like, no. When he was a tape op, when he was an assistant engineer, what those kids did was go and make tea for the engineer. And there were two assistants at this one studio. One was Flood, and he filled the, the tea cups all the way to the top. And there was another kid called Drought, who sensibly left an inch on the cups of tea so there's no possibility of spilling it on the, on the equipment. And you'd think that people would ask for drought mm. because he was sensible and everything was safe. Everybody asked for flood because he filled the cups all the way to the top. And so he got his beginning not because of his skills, which are obviously huge, but because of this other thing. Organically and spiritually, what do you think he brings to the table? Insight, empathy, depth. 
so I, you know, you could see him on. Uh, there's a there's a documentary with uh, 30 Seconds to Mars mm -hmm. called Artifact. As far as a secular a view of how the music business really is, that is the truth. Right. You see Flood trying to help them navigate that stuff, and that's what a good producer does. To me. You know, some people think a producer can mix, use all the controls, understand frequencies. Yes, but you also need to understand uh, psychological makeup and profile of a performer, the things that drive people. And you also have to be humble enough that if the only thing you can contribute is doing someone's laundry, you should do their laundry. You, if you want to help, you should help. And I see that in Flood, certainly. Did you spend any time with Sir Richard Branson, the owner of Virgin Records, and 400 other multi-billion dollar organizations? Looking back, the time that we did spend, because he was running Virgin Records then, um, himself and a guy called Simon Draper, his CEO. Any time that we spent, I think, I, I think about my attitude as a 20-year-old punk. He was the record label scum. You know, mm -hmm. I think anything he said was like, yeah, you know, uh, in, in retrospect, he supported a very difficult band to work with at a crazy time for everybody. Um, I've seen him a few times since. I saw him on the inaugural flight from L.A. to Chicago. I've seen him at the Virgin Hotel in Chicago. And uh, he's been very nice. And he says he remembers me. I don't I don't think he does. But it's really nice that he pretends that he might. Isn't it funny how when, when we're kids, we just think we know it all. And then we look back and we're sorry. Hey, these people were actually trying to help us. Yeah, we're just idiots. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing you could do, though. My eldest son is 23. I have four boys. And you can't tell people what the deal is. They have to touch the wet paint for themselves. She worked for Acne Attractions, which was owned by Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren. Now she owns Rough Trade Records. What do you remember about Jeanette Lee? This was 79. And, you know, it's the traditional rock and roll things, like who are the members of the band and how proficient are they on their instruments? Pill was different. When I was on the front cover of Melody Maker, it was me, Wobble, Keith, John, Jeanette and Dave Crow, our accountant. It's like, this is our business unit, the six of us. And I was so proud of that. That felt so next level dangerous after punk was just dangerous and in your face. This is dangerous in a different way. I love Jeanette a lot. She brought that kind of a managerial expertise, actually, to the situation without really a defined role. So sometimes she was creative filming things. Other times I think she was being more philosophical and helping us through some stuff. But not a situation I can imagine anybody really wanting to deal with, especially as things started to spiral. How have you escaped becoming a casualty of sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> I don't think anybody who came up in the late 70s and succeeded in the 80s was unscathed by anything. And that would also be true of me. Sometimes I drink a lot. I had 16 years sober, which rather than be like, yeah, or, or me say, so that proves I can be sober. Uh, to me, that proves I had a problem. You know, wow, I must have had a problem to be 16 years sober. And at a point, the drug of choice for punks was speed. So at a point, I was, um, uh, I would get prescription speed and travel with it, with a, with a prescription. So I don't know that I was unscathed, or I am unscathed. All I can do with that experience now is look out for that in others, and certainly look out for that in myself, and look out for that um, within my family. How do you juggle four sons, a wife, a record label, Invisible Records, and a book tour without going crazy? And drumming, mm -hmm. and you know? Drumming. So, but, but that's interesting. About two months ago, um, things were starting to get crazy. Um, and Leslie Rankin called me up. She said, do you want to come and do drums in New York, Chicago, LA, uh, San Francisco, w uh, play drums with me? And my immediate reaction was like, well, that's crazy. I don't have time to learn these songs uh, and execute them professionally and do this traveling 
whilst teaching, working on the book and doing this other stuff. But I said yes. Like, yeah, I want to do that. And I knew that I'd taken on too much. And then, after committing to those dates, um, the guys from Dark Matter Coffee, I have my own coffee called mm. Get the Fuck Out of Bed. They call me up. They're like, do you want to go to Tokyo and launch your coffee in Japan? Like, well, I haven't been to Tokyo in 35 years since we did uh, the, 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 it's my last pill show in Fukuoka. I said, yes. So now I've got the dates with Ruby. I've got all this other stuff. And now I've got a trip to Tokyo with the travel and the jet lag. But what happened after I went to New York to, to play with Leslie and took on too much, I felt this strange equilibrium because I'm supposed to play my drums. And when I don't, it unbalances me. I've just learned that now at the age of 59. I've had two and three years straight of not playing here and there. And when I get to travel and meet people, I get to do other things, like, like talking to you today. And it's all of this stuff which makes me who I am, f fully me. And when I am fully me, I'm, I'm better for everybody I'm, I'm, I'm working with. So I'm trying to stop juggling and just have everything be part of the soup that I'm in. Uh, and I'm just a few weeks into trying to find that balance, but I'm liking it so far. Your new book, Memories, My Five Years In and Out of Public Image, 1979 to 1985. It's a few things. At one point, it was almost just a coffee table book because I have the hand-typed itinerary from when we went to Paris in 1980. I've got the backstage pass, the metro ticket. Um, I've got the itineraries from the 80 tour, my diaries, so many photographs that no one's ever seen. And it could have just been that. I thought, no, I want to, I want to put down, I'm a writer, you know, um, I want to put down my memories of this. And then, after I saw the Public Images Rotten documentary, mm -hmm. which I'm in, and they did a good job of interviewing a bunch of people. There's a few people that they didn't interview, one of which is Keith Levine, mm. one of which is Larry White, who manages, managed us for a difficult two years. So I'm like, well, okay, I, I'm going to talk to Keith. And I thought I was risking allowing Keith in my book, which you think, look, it's my book. I, I only want good things about me in my book. But by taking this risk of opening my book to Keith and Skyping with him for nearly three hours, we had this revelatory conversation that was such a gift to me in or out of the book, you know, in terms of my life. So I'm like, okay. Then I, I called uh, Bruce Butler, who met us off the plane in Australia, Larry White, Keith Borton, um, Bob Miller, who did the, the, the New York sessions, Bob Tulipan, Maureen Baker, uh, some guy who saw a show on his birthday in England and missed his last train home, some, somebody who had his windshield kicked in at the Olympic Auditorium. It's like, it's everybody's story. So I'm putting all of that together. Um, you know, I got my master's degree uh, earlier this year, and I certainly sense a more scholarly approach to this crazy subject, a more organized approach. And certainly I still go off on my tangents, but there's, a, there's an organized uh, uh, format to all of this information. What did you think of the Bill Laswell produced album, quotation marks, by Public Image LTD in 1986 with Steve I and Ginger Baker? So I chose to leave the band. Mm -hmm. I was fired a couple of times, but I chose to leave in 1985. And when I heard that I was being replaced by Ginger Baker and Tony Williams, from, I was just like, oh, well, no, I want to I want to be in a band with Ginger Baker. You know, I used to sit watching the television with Cream, you know. I'm like, oh, my God, you know. And then I saw the packaging, T-shirt, poster, CD, cassette. I'm like, oh, this is genius. This is just genius. Um, and it made me kind of sad. You know, I... I I needed to leave and, and, and go on with my life. But it made me sad that I left that creativity. But in terms of my book, um, I just read an interview with Ginger Baker. Um, and he was asked about working with John. And he had, he had no idea what the interviewer was talking about. He said he didn't choose to work on a Pill album. He did a session for Bill Laswell mm. that John sang over, which became, which became a Pill track. 
So it's kind of interesting, um, which, which is the same. I look for confirmation from other areas of the things that I think or the things that I think I know. And the way I thought we put the Flowers of Romance together, fully formed tracks, John would come in, sing and leave is exactly how album was put together by Bill Laswell. You know, uh, he, he formed those s songs. And um, is it Rise? Was, there's, there's some really good tracks on there. Really great. I think I went and saw them on that tour as well. As Bill Laswell wanted to, to hand pick his golden children for this project. Yeah. So, there, so don't feel bad about it. You, 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 even well, if you had no. been in the band, he might have said, there's the door. <laughs> well, yeah, but... There's, there's one thing that, that I don't know if it exists in Pill anymore, which is I would have said, yeah, f fuck off, Bill. I've been in the band for five years. I'm not leaving now. You know, John, let's, what do we do? You know, James Murphy from LCD Sound System sent me a button. He made me a button that said it took Ginger Baker and Tony Williams to replace me. Exactly. Like, well, I'm supposed to wear this button? Like, it was nice that he did it. But, and it's true. It's true. Red Stripe. Why is it such an important beer? Wow. Yeah, I, so I think the title of my New York chapter of my book is going to be Red Stripe, White Lines. <laughs> da -da. Uh, I, it's just, we were, everybody in England at that time, we were infatuated with dub mm. um, and a huge Jamaican scene. You know, John almost became head of Virgin Records dub division mm -hmm. you know Richard Branson flew him to Jamaica and um, John always got along uh, really great with all those dub uh, dub guys um, and that's their beer of choice so that we would that's what we would drink uh, in John's apartment John's house in London would listen to dub and smoke and drink cases and cases of red stripe martin adkins it's been great having you on the blaring well, out with eric blair you. show this is the blaring out with eric blair show with martin adkins signing off the blaring out show